Hey everyone, I'm Jesse Sparks, host of the new podcast, The One Recipe, from the team behind The Splendid Table. This pod is all about that one recipe that you lean on. The one you share with friends, the one you make when you need a little love, and the one you know will work every single time. Every week, I talk with chefs and gifted cooks from all over the world about their one and the story behind it. We're here to help you build your kitchen library one dish at a time. Follow The One Recipe wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Nectar Corridor, a podcast where we explore the incredible world of mezcal, the most emblematic and diverse spirit of Mexico. I'm your host, Nikki Nakazawa. Today is part one of a two-part episode, where we'll be visiting Eduardo Ángeles of La Locura in Santa Catarina Minas, who you will remember from episode one, and my friend Cuca Cortés of Mezcal Cortés in La Pila, Mehuatlán. During today's show, we'll be talking about the diverse species of agave, or maguey, found in their communities, how and where they grow, and when they're ready for harvest. And then we'll get into how the hearts of the maguey, also known as piñas, are cooked. In part two, we'll continue our tours with Lalo and Kuka and get into fermentation and the different distillation processes that they use in their respective productive regions. So without further ado, let's meet Lalo at his maguey and tree nursery on his palenque in Santa Catarina Minas. This podcast was originally recorded in Spanish. Our conversation with Lalo is interpreted by Sasha Desiree. The La Locura Palenque is located just south of Oaxaca City, off of the Highway 175. I met Lalo there on a bright, clear day in November, just a week after the Dia de Muertos, when the landscape was still carpeted with yellow, orange, and magenta flowers, and folks had begun to harvest their corn crops. We started our tour in the greenhouse, which is just a short walk between Lalo's house and the Palenque. Sí, pues dentro de lo que tenemos, ya de las de las plantas adultas que tenemos, tenemos este una parte de esas plantas. So, what we already have in the nursery here are adult plants, which we use as mother plants. After they reach that final stage of maturity, they produce flowers, fruits, and seeds. Then we collect those seeds and we replant them. These seeds take about two months to grow, and the little plants are then ready to move on to the second phase, which is to grow inside of a small plastic bag filled with soil and fertilizer. These then take around 9 to 12 months to continue growing. So the objective of the nursery is twofold. Obviously, growing the plants this way will propagate diverse species, which will serve the production of mezcal. But it is also a way to observe the evolutionary growth of the plants. The goal long term is that mezcal producing families will have their own plants. Because a lot of these communities have inherited the knowledge of how to make mezcal, but I think it's just as important to be able to inherit the maguey itself. Lalo cultivates all kinds of agave here in Santa Catarina Minas, either as mother plants, which he uses cuttings of to propagate other plants, or as the individual magueyes. These magueyes include espadín, which often produce the most offspring, and cuiche, or Mexicano, as growers call it in other places. Then there's San Martinero and Arroqueño, which are both grown from seed, as well as Tepestate, Tobala, and Coyote, none of which reproduce through their rhizomes. This year, Lalo counted 14 different species and subspecies of maguey that grow on site at La Locura. Harvesting time can vary from species to species, taking anywhere from 10 years for the fastest growing plants to 30 plus years for the slowest. So how do you know when the plants are ready for harvest? It's a really interesting question because traditional mezcal is limited to only using ripe maguey. In the center of the plant, there are cells that produce stalks. The life cycle of the plant, like with every other living thing, is birth, growth, reproduction, and death. 
So during the growing phase, the number of stalks will represent the amount of energy or life that is left in the plant before it reaches the reproduction stage. And at that point, instead of leaves or stalks, a kind of tree appears in the center, and we call that a kyote. All the water and nutrients are concentrated in the kyote. At first it appears in the form of a candle, and then it forms offshoots or little branches that have flowers, fruits, and seeds within the fruits. In some species, the flowers are aborted because the plant feels that it lacks the amount of reserves necessary to produce all of the seeds. So one of the flowers sacrifices itself as a result. In that same area where the flower was removed, new little maguey plants appear as a natural process. Just like humans grow teeth, the plants grow root buds, which can then be replanted in the field. When the magueyes are mature, they're harvested. Mezcaleros use sharp tools like machetes or axes to cut the maguey and remove the leaves. If you can imagine a maguey with all of the stalks removed, what's left at the base often looks sort of like a very large pineapple. And this is exactly what the heart is called in Spanish, a piña. These piñas are then taken to the palenque for the next phase of mezcal production. From Lalo's nursery, we took a short walk to a field next to his tasting room to learn about the different kinds of maguey he uses in his productions. The first thing I noticed was a delicate spider web woven between the leaves of a maguey. That's a sign that there's no pesticides around. The spiders do all the pest control for us. And since most insects land on top of the leaves, it's like they're falling into a literal trap with these webs. We also have little birds that love to eat the insects and beetles that often cause the most damage to our maguey's. These birds manage to get into the hardest to reach spots at the base of the plants. They're unfazed by the thorns, and they do a great job of cleaning up the plants. So, this maguey here is called espadín capón, which is when the stalk is cut off earlier in the growth process. This gives the piñas a richer flavor, but it renders the plant no longer useful for further propagation. They contain the most amount of sugar and weigh, on average, about 45 kilos. To make one liter of mezcal, you only need about 15 kilos. This one here is actually ready for harvest. I think we're going to cut it tomorrow. Remember how I said that Lalo is growing 14 different species and varieties of maguey, and that each species reaches maturity at different times? It's a lot to keep track of. We walked past a Marteño maguey, which takes an average of 18 years to fully mature. A sub-variety of agave Karwinski it yielded 22 liters of mezcal this season. That's right, 18 years for just 22 liters. We then walked over to Lalo's oven, a large earthen pit which is protected by a roof in the case of rain. Y el horno pues es es una esto es algo interesante en Santa Catarina Minas los hornos Here in Santa Catarina de Minas, the ovens are conical and made of dirt. This is how they've always been. This one has a depth of 2.5 meters. The diameter at the base is 2 meters, and at the top, it's a little over 5 meters. I place the firewood and then light a fire. When the wood is burning, I make a bed of rocks about a meter and a half in height on top of the logs. We'll leave this to burn for about 10 hours. The heat is retained by the rocks, and even when the wood has burned off, and as the heat releases little by little, the maguey's will get cooked. So after these 10 hours, we place the maguey into the oven and cover it with damp maguey fibers first, then dry fibers, and then a blanket. On top of all that, we add dirt and form a kind of volcano. We add about 40 liters of water in order to release the smoke that is trapped inside the oven. We put a cross on top, and we cover it. After five days, we remove the cross, we remove the soil, we remove the fiber, we remove the blanket, and we bring the cooked maguey into this other area. 
This part is very important, since, according to the anthropological origin of the word mezcal, it means maguey cooked in this system of ovens. So here, we wait for a minimum of eight days to two months for the magueys to be ready to move on to the next phase, which is crushing and then fermentation. One of the most important things to consider is that magueys were also cooked in order to be eaten. Lalo gave me a bit of cooked tepistate to taste. It smelled woody, with notes of cacao and peanut. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have a lot of sugar, so people eat it to eat it. Historically, maguey was a very important food in pre-Hispanic Mexico, almost as significant as corn. To give you a sense of the tremendous diversity in mezcal-producing traditions in Oaxaca alone, I went to visit my friend Cuca Cortez, a young 29-year-old producer based in La Pila, a community just a few kilometers away from where I work in the district of Mihuatlan. This area is about an hour and a half drive south from where La Locura is along the 175 highway at the most southern edge of the Central Valleys and the base of the Sierra Sur mountain range. We began our tour in a field of maguey right behind where her family's palenque is, and from there she showed me the oven where she and her father cook the piñas for their productions. Our conversation with Cuca is interpreted by Rosina Castillo. Mira, pues trabajamos acá y empezamos desde marzo. Mezcal production here typically goes from March until June or July. This period of three or four months tends to be very hot, which results in a better yield of mezcal. Our espadín alone yields about 400 or 500 liters, while other species give up about 2 to 300 liters. And then in the off-season, we plant and harvest beans and corn, but we also monitor the growth of the magueys that were planted earlier in the year. We determine which magueys will be ready to harvest in the coming year so that we have a better idea of how much mezcal we will be able to produce. Cuckoo and her father have always harvested in accordance with the lunar cycle, the new moon being the ideal time. Almost everything you see planted here is well-grown. We have wild viquiche, madre quiche, etc. What we do so is the espadín, which is what we mostly grow and use. But everything else propagates on its own. We do save some seeds to ensure that we can continue to grow each species. So we'll save some tobasiche, tobala, and pulquero seeds. But saving these seeds and then planting them inherently changes the maguey that will grow from it. You can't say that it's the same after you have replanted it. Kuka attributes this change to anything from the weather to the soil. Once you take a seed from the ground and plant it elsewhere, you're not going to get an exact replica. On her land, she has both black and red soil. The black soil works best because it has more proteins. The piñas that grow in black soil will be smaller than the ones in red soil, but they will end up yielding more mezcal. The piñas grown in red soil are quite large, but they still yield less. But you have to embrace both. We want to appreciate everything that the land gives us. It all tastes good, and we have to continue taking care of the land so that we don't run out of mezcal. Kuka then took me to see her oven where I noticed that her process for cooking the maguey is different from Lalo's. So to start, the oven needs to be cleaned. We remove all the stones that are no longer useful. And then we put figs and firewood from the field into the oven. And then we add the new stones. Once the oven is ready, we turn it on at 2 in the morning. It takes about 4 to 5 hours to heat up. And then we place the piñas directly on top of the stones and stack cement blocks and dirt on top of the piñas. 
Everything cooks for five or six days and then we take out the piñas and leave them in the direct sunlight for 15 days. Because they come out of the oven super sweet and sitting in the sun gives them a little more complexity in terms of flavor. It adds a nice bitterness. That's almost three weeks just to cook the piñas. Cook explained that after two rounds of cooking in the oven, the stones need to be replaced because they won't hold up for a third round. Once the old stones are removed, they're placed in an area of the field where they essentially become compost for the corn and beans that will be grown later in the year. They carry so many minerals that that's really their only use at that point. And the type of firewood that we use is also really important. The wood we find nearby is more resistant. It takes a good amount of time to burn. And that adds really good flavor to the piñas as they cook. We use eucalyptus firewood too because it's super resistant and cooks the maguey nicely. Some of the trees that get cut down are massive, like 200, 300 kilos. In terms of knowing exactly when to take the maguey out of the oven, you have to keep an eye on it. You will see that this huge mound of dirt and wood and stone slowly gets smaller as the fire consumes the inside of the oven. And so you get a feel for when the maguey is fully cooked and ready. I was curious to know if Kuka had any rituals when it came to cooking the maguey. Lalo mentioned that he adds a cross on top of his oven during the cooking period, and it's common for people in different communities to have a belief or superstition associated with their horno. We don't have anything particularly ritualistic, but one thing we do is that before adding the piñas to the oven, we add chiles. We see it as a way to ensure that the maguey will be fully cooked and sort of a way to ward off bad energies. And of course, we add a little cross on top. It's like asking God to help us out. We have someone climb to the top of the mound and top it off with a cross for good luck. In part two of this episode exploring the process of making mezcal, we'll continue our Palenque visits with Lalo in Santa Catarina Minas and Cuca in La Pila Mihuatlan to learn about their different approaches to fermentation and distillation. Many thanks to Lalo and Cuca and to you all for tuning in. Thanks to our voice actors, Sasha Desiree and Rosina Castillo. Saludos desde las Sierras del Mezcal y hasta la próxima. The Nectar Corridor is part of the Whetstone Radio Collective. Thank you to the Nectar Corridor team, producer Jackie Nowak, Associate Producer, Rosina Castillo, Editors, Andres Jimenez and Max Kotelchuk, and Research, Olivia Mayeda. English translations are by Jackie Nowak, with editorial help from Carlin Crosby and Emily Vizzo. Cover art by Alex Bowman. Thank you to Las Norteñitas de Oro for the use of our theme song, Jinetes en el Cielo. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective Head of Podcast Celine Glazier, Sound Engineer Max Kotelchuk, Associate Producer Quentin LeBeau, Production Assistant and Melissa Utinko, and Sound Intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more video podcast content. You can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone Media at whetstonemedia.com. The Nectar Corridor is originally produced and recorded in Spanish. If you'd like to listen to the original interview, you can search for El Corredor del Nectar wherever you get your podcasts.